Good morning. For those of you that are in the same time zone as me, at least, uh, it's 8.03 a.m. here in, well, just, uh, I'll be technical because there's a lot of debate around this. I am just south of Detroit, so I am uh, not in Detroit proper, uh, it, which is a funny, funny debate for those of you that have, uh, or those of you that live in this area of, are you a Detroiter? Then people claim to be from Detroit. And you're like, yeah, but technically you live in the burbs, so you're not part of Detroit. So I still say from Detroit when people ask, because it's easier than saying I'm in Southgate, Michigan. Either way, welcome to Vlog Thursday, episode 149, talking turkeys, tech, and Teslas. Uh, and I did rename my car because... You know, I'll bring up the Tesla stuff real quick. Let me drag this over here. Good evening in Sweden. Awesome. Uh, I say uh, rename my car because of people that asked me when I thought of Cybertruck. And I'm like, well, I ordered one. So that's what I think of them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I did decide to rename my car. and I called it Cybercar because it, why not be cheesy and uh, silly and all that fun stuff. And, uh, whoops, let's go ahead and cl uh, clear, whoop, clear, what was that? There we go. <laughs> I have fans all the way in India, Germany, Sweden, awesome. You know, being international is really cool. And uh, I, I think a lot of people, and maybe it's just a lot of people I know, they don't realize or think about as much, and it's whatever it's it's part of uh being an american i guess is that we think you know everything kind of centers around us in some way and the reality is like the world is so much bigger people are always blown away the average american i would say is truly blown away when they find out how small of a population america represents <laughs> so it's always uh it's always interesting to me when you tell people um you know the scope and scale when you start talking about numbers you're like oh wow america's kind of small i'm like yeah yeah comparatively speaking Anyways, what was I doing to make me a couple minutes late? This. Uh, making sure everything was up to date. I restart all the servers and da-da-da-da-da. Make sure all this little, you know, patches, details, uh, everything's up, running, and happy. So uh, it took me a couple extra minutes. I was in the – I do – fastidiously is that i think that's the right word like i'm very meticulous about how i uh, do all the backups all the servers and restart all of them and uh yeah so absolutely um one of those things that i'm very meticulous make sure everything's backed up have i talked about squid proxy and kaspersky no i don't use squid proxy at all uh squid proxy is a nightmare and you know, here, let's just, let's break right down into Squid Proxy, right? Uh, exit, close windows, close that window, and hey, this is all my backups, uh, mirroring them to an immutable state. I've talked about that before I take them offline. But one of the problems with uh, Squid Proxy So here's Squid Proxy. Let's see. When's their last update? Hmm. Let me think. It's going to be really, really old. Uh, getting Squid. Official source code release. There we go. Oh, they're a little bit more up to date than I expected. So, you know, at 4 9 November, but I don't know. The project just trying to proxy connections, it just breaks too many things. I just don't like doing it. It's a mess. Uh, it's not a big deal. Does it hurt me when you skip ads? Don't watch them on my behalf, please. I, I it, it's, I don't know the exact conversion. There's a certain fee uh, that I get from ads coming through. I don't know what all that is, but if you skip it, uh, please do skip it. So um, they're not unless the ad's good. I mean, then then watch it. <laughs> I don't know what the conversion click through rate is. Uh, I don't dig into those. I don't spend a lot of time about those details because it's something out of my uh, control. So that's definitely a thing. Um, oh, the hubs. Yeah, you know, I want to do a video about it. Uh, I haven't really spent a ton of time with it, but hey, while we're at it, let's go ahead and update this. So we're going to go ahead and update my server while we're live on the air. Updates, get the latest version. And we can talk about the hub because they keep adding more to it, which is really cool. And if you're not familiar with the hub is, uh, this is a way, and after this update, it should work even better. This is a way to very easily go and install a new version, new VMs, uh, pretty simple. So... 
it's kind of a cool way, one click install to add something to the server. Uh, it It's kind of neat. I like it. I don't like, I don't know, I always load them manually, so I don't use it much. So I have to, if I do a video about it, it's going to be less about me using it all the time because I've not had a problem when you go here. Actually, let's go to the other one because this one's updating. Uh, my, I'm done with Squid though, by the way, because I don't care enough about it. It's just, it, it, all the troubleshooting with it is why I don't like it. So, and everyone always seems to be upset by that because they really want me to go crazy on doing Squid stuff. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, that's not the right one. That's the lab one. That's turned off at the one we want. This one. This one's on. Is Zen Orchestra free? Well, yes. This is free, but they offer... So uh, it's, it, it's complicated. I've done a lot of videos on it. So yes, it's free. Uh, if you use the open source version, it's 100% free. If you use the open source version, but they compile it for you and keep and maintain update... It's still free, but you're missing some features and uh, basic features. So they have a comparison. Where is their comparison chart somewhere? Mm, basic features, limited pro support. It, even the free version is pretty amazing. Now, the other side of that, if you want to compile it yourself, uh, then in technically it's free. You're just uh, responsible for maintaining it. And I keep two versions all, all times on my system here. Let's just refresh this page while it updates. Uh, upgrade. Yeah, it's still upgrading. Anyways, so this version here, see how it says no support. I compiled this myself. So if you compile it yourself and maintain it completely yourself, it's an open source product. What you're paying for is as they say right here, you're paying for the support if you want the support for it, if you want to uh, not have to. And $77 a month for an enterprise product like this is pretty damn amazing. Auto patching features, they got so many cool things you get with it. Uh, rolling snatch full backup, backup reports. Oh, okay, product matrix. There we go. It's down here. So even the free one, turnkey security, uh, secured appliance, limited pro support, web updater, uh, XVA import, VM stats, uh, hyper-threading detection. Um, all this is just free. Basic features like uh, allow your VM uh, servers from a web browser. So right here, I'm using the free version. It's, well, it's actually upgrading right now. But I can go through, I can get into and manipulate any of these systems on an as-needed basis. So, yeah, they absolutely, I've got a bunch of videos on Zen Orchestra. So go to my channel, and I'm getting ready to do a new uh, video on, this is actually why the lab server is turned off. It's going to become part of another video process. Um, I'm going to do a whole start to finish, because right now they are on version. So go to the host here. Uh, these are running on version 8. Where does it tell you that? Mm, is it stats? General? Oh, right here. I'm looking right in the middle, staring right at me. Uh, XCPNG version 8.0. Now that they're on version 8 and all the changes they've done, I've went ahead and uh, done the whole thing. Like I've done the, oh, I'm sorry. Got it ahead of myself. Uh, it, I'm going to do the whole thing from start to finish on how to set this up, load the 8.0 version with all the features and how to get rolling with it. And I'll probably at that point cover the hub because it helps some people who are going, I don't understand a few aspects of this. Uh, in a way, you know, they're not sure how to get the VM set up on there. There's, I have entire videos on how to compile it. It's, there's some videos on, I have on how to compile it. There is, uh, how to compile from source. I, look, you type it in, I literally have the video on how to do it. Um, there's also, they have step-by-step -step every piece of how to do it. And then there's a GitHub project uh, that has all of the, like some auto magic so you can do it as well. So you can use the GitHub project that will allow you to do as well. I have a video on that. So if you just type in Zen Orchestra, walk through all my videos, there's not a question. I don't think I haven't answered in it. Uh, the only thing about those videos is they're going to be a slightly older version of Zen Server, but they're accurate. The only thing you're missing is maybe like some of the new stuff they've added. Like before they had two backups, now they have one. They used to call it backup NG and backup. 
And I always said, backup NG is a new version. You want to use that. Well, now you don't have to worry about it because only backup NG exists. So I'll make some more updated videos on it, but it, for the most part, it still works the same way. Um, as a matter of fact, you're looking at the backups on here. Uh, let's back up my Unify server. It hasn't been backed up in... I can go to the logs here. So when was the last time it... Uh, I have a log and when I backed it up, somewhere. You can go down here and type in... So wiki, yeah, Unify backup was done on November 23rd. Right there's the report for it. So it's a great product. And it, this is also where people get confused because the way their integrated backups are, when you're comparing this to things like um, VMware, they're used to having to buy third-party products. Zen Orchestra combined with XCP and G server is a holistic product that gives you full backups of your virtual machines and everything else um, that you may want uh, all right here. So yeah, that's uh, someone said November 28th. No, it's November 23rd right here. That's when the backup is. Let's do another one because there's been another version of Unify. Hey, thank you V for throwing some money at me. Um, someone threw in a 20 and I don't know where it came from because it doesn't show and, and I only see the last person that did it. So thank you to the first person to throw in. And thank you, V, for throwing in some money. I do appreciate it. It is, uh, it all goes towards helping the channel and my deposit for the Tesla truck. <laughs> so let's go ahead and hit backup on Unify. Interrupted. What happened? Interrupted. Something went wrong. I'll figure that out later. You know what? I know what's wrong. Let me go over here. I bet I know exactly what's wrong. It doesn't have a connection to the backup. Or does it? What is up with this? Well, I see the backup. And we have 4.8 terabytes of extra storage available. So, I don't know. Hmm. Solve for another time. Settings, backup overview. Oh, job protected to protect VDI chain. Okay. I know what that is. That's because I was running snapshots. Now, this is something that's important to... Uh, Josh Edinburgh, thank you for four ninety nine. Did you get my free things? I don't know if free things... Refresh my memory. Did you send me something? I, I'm sometimes bad with uh, remembering that. So <laughs> I'm actually very terrible with names. I remember like services and all kinds of other stuff, but names I don't always remember. So troubleshoot live. There's no troubleshooting in this. Uh, not that there's not able. It's what happened. So job canceled for VDI chain. VDI chain protection. I actually have a video on this, but let's go over it real quick. Backups jobs regularly delete snapshots. When a snapshot is deleted, either manually or via backup job, it triggers the need for Zen Server to coalesce a v VDI chain. To merge the remaining VDI's base copy in the chain, this means generally we cannot take too many snapshots on said VM until Zen Server has finished running a coalesced job on the VDI chain. What happens is, and I believe if we do another search, they have a graphic of this, which helps. So, uh, if we say coalesce EDI. Matter of fact, let's do an image search because I know what the image looks like. Um, ooh, yeah, here we go. Someone has a whole slide share of this. There, there we go. Citrix has uh, also used the same source code for Zen Server, so this is going to be relevant for both, but this is coalescing. So you have snapshot A, snapshot B, creating C, so VHD, thin files to provision, contains right points of snapshot. And let's jump ahead a little bit. There we go, automated coalescing example. VM snapshots. And this is the problem. When you see a snapshot, and I can actually go ahead and create a snapshot. So even though the VDI chain has not coalesced yet, watch this. I can go here. I can go to disk. and I'm sorry, snapshots. Snapshot. I can still take snapshots while this is happening. But 
it's happening and I can spin up, spin up another VM of this and it will work. But it sometimes has not coalesced all this data together. So when it does the backup, you want the backup to be from a fully coalesced, cohesive VDI. So it's telling you and it's just being smart about it going, no, you're not actually going to go. He's a backup because it has not coalesced because of these snapshots. But these snapshots uh, can occur and still work and be exported differently. So it's kind of it, it seems a little confusing, but it's not if you get really you got to go through and it's one of those really complicated situations. But when you're done, that's why there's 58 slides on this, uh, <laughs> you know, and probably a bunch of them are going to be dedicated to. Yeah. So this is all the different like calculations. There's a lot like when you start digging into how VMs work in the back end, it is a incredibly uh, brilliant but complicated system. It's not beyond comprehension, of course, because this is written by normal people. But uh, when you really find out it's not just, you know, virtualizing, it's the management of hard drives is a very complicated thing. Um, all the cool things we like about these is also challenging to write the code for on the back end. And the people over at uh, XCPNG have just done an amazing job. So it's kind of cool to go over all that. Like I said, there's nothing to really troubleshoot. It's just it hasn't coalesced and the garbage collection process really hasn't done. So uh, you can go through here. This is uh, some walkthrough. One of the things that, um, is kind of cool about Zen Server is having full command line access. So you can go in and start doing all of these things here to see what's going on behind the scenes to figure out like, okay, what's going on here? What's going on here? Maybe I'll do some videos on it. I really haven't had to do any deep troubleshooting. Um, it is kind of just like it said, it's just, well, it's coalescing, so you can't do the thing right now. <laughs> uh, Is OpenVPN better for core clock speed or core? Uh, I want to say OpenVPN is, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. I'm going to guess, though, that core clock speed is better, but it depends on how many streams you have. OpenVPN, um, multiple threads, that's the word I was looking for. So this is the roadmap. Let's read through the errata here. A threading. Currently, OpenVPN is scaled on SMP machines by adding processes rather than threads. While it might be interesting to look into scaling OpenVPN across threads, there may be kernel-level bottlenecks SMP. This aid the note problems that Facebook had when trying to scale uh, memcached. Specifically, the problems of having multiple threads contend with a single UDP socket. So that is interesting. So that still didn't truly answer our question of where is it? Here we go. Answered. I love when it says answered. Uh, install the server, one client, same problem, only able to use the power of one CPU core. If you have three clients running iPerf anywhere in parallel. This is 18. Okay. Yeah, so it sounds like cores are going to be faster. So faster core is going to be the fa is the answer for that one. Um, awesome prepping a smoker. Hey, it's nothing like a good smoke turkey. Uh, yeah, I don't remember names without PIDs. There's probably some truth to that. <laughs> uh. You can, anyone can make this stuff. It takes the time of just really committing yourself to learning it. It's not, it always seems difficult until you know it. And it just, I don't know, I've been doing it for 25 years. So there's not a lot of, I just grab it and start working on it. So, uh, Steven, thank you. Thanks, Tom, for all your work and dedication to this channel and the community. Awesome. Glad I can be help, um, of help. Do you run enterprise hit grazing your hard drive? Looking at backplace stats from the consumer drives is not bad. The, well, well, let's let's dive into this. This is this is uh, my wonderful. I almost want to swear at this. Uh, it's got to be in here somewhere. Uh, moving system in. This is such a great disaster from HP. I think this is where I seen it. 
Uh, HP support site down. Oh, here we go. This is a disaster. So enterprise drives, there is a difference. There is no doubt. And right here, we had this issue when six SSDs died in a span of 15 minutes. Some data was lost and we had an outage that lasted for days. Uh, no one could believe that the SSDs, so they ended up replacing a lot of parts of the server. And what this is, is a crazy bulletin from HP that you can only run their enterprise drives that are SSDs. These are the high-end expensive ones for three years, 270 days and eight hours and they turn off. <laughs> this was just crazy. Um, it's just, I don't know. So enterprise drives, there are differences, especially in some of the NAS drives. So if we go here, and this was a good article I found. Let me dig through. I bookmarked so many articles that I read and I have them. Uh, this is older from Puget Systems. It's understanding the WD rainbow. Um, and they break down the different drives. So your blue drive, your green drive, your black performance drive. Now we get into the reds. And this is where things are going to get interesting. And this is what separates the uh, NAS drives or a more enterprise uh, drive versus that. Um, so when you get into uh, rotary accelerated feed forward, and there's another uh, feature in here for the way they do, where is it at? TLER. So we're going to should you use this? Here comes an entire overnight. Should you use a TLR drive for your Raider NAS? These are some of the differences. The firmware itself is actually different. And what this does is um, a curious reader posted a question, which I've had to remove for reference specific companies. But basically, TLR is important to RAID sets and prevents dropouts on prolonged error recovery. So to get all the way to the first question, do you use enterprise drives? Not all the time. So I have a mix of drives, but you may want to look at drives, whether or not you consider WD Red a consumer or a uh, somewhat enterprise drive. They're made for NAS boxes and you think NAS, you think maybe small business or home user. Yeah, and this is an important aspect of having some of these features. But, but that being said, Backblaze has still proved that you can do this even without having um, TLER. So eh, it's still, you know, you, you can have these drives, but you run the risk of the drive pausing more and having a problem. I have a video from several years ago on Toshiba drives. They don't like the ones I bought had a problem with FreeNAS. When one had an error, they all kept getting errors is kind of what the debunk of it was of trying to figure out what the hell was going on. Um, one drive was having a problem. It caused all the drives to pause because I believe it was just a standard consumer drive I put in there. So it seemed to cause a little bit more drama than versus the way the air recovery works. So it's not exactly bad to use them, but it could be a problem you run into maybe in circumstances. So, uh, but I, I use a mix. I have some enterprise SAS drives that are in those R710s because I got them for cheap. I have my FreeNAS, one FreeNAS runs enterprise SAS drives. The other one is filled with consumer drives. And I have no, the other one's been filled with consumer drives for like six years that still run. So um, hopefully that helps. Someone says, how much do I charge for my service? Uh, our general rate is posted. So if we go to, I think it's still on here. And we keep raising our rates. Uh, so this is as of right now on our website, as of November 28th, 2019, we are charging people 200 per hour right there. That's what our general service rate costs. So um, my rate is 250 per hour for me. So for people that want me, it, it's 250 an hour. So yeah, that uh, comes down to how you want to, we're very public about it. We don't hide any of it. And we put it on here. Um, uh, we put that on here purposely so people don't have to even bother contacting a human at LTS to just ask what's your rate. So uh, we keep that on there. We also have, when you go to the main site, it's up here at the very top, it says hire us. So it's on our contact page and the hire us page. Hire us page is the same as the contact page without the contact information. It's just the hire us page. So hopefully that helps. Um, I have this free NAS running. And let's pull up the disks right here. Uh, volumes, view disks. Does it tell me how many hours the users are running for? 
Mm, I have to log in from the command line and do that. So this is a. Uh, these are our consumer drives in here. Um, old two terabyte uh, drives. So um, they've been running since these were expensive when I bought them. That, that's how long ago. So I look up the year on. But I'll show you that, yes, these ones run consumer drives and in my other NAS. And this one's going to get updated. I keep it on the old version. Um, let me go over here to this NAS. This one has enterprise drives in it. So go here. Look at the disks. These are all enterprise uh, SAS drives. They happen to be two terabytes as well because well, they're expensive. Um, but it's kind of a comparison. These ones work fine. The other ones work fine. Matter of fact, the only problem I had with this one, it was kind of a joke I posted on Twitter. Uh, one of them decided it didn't want to read anymore. I don't know why. I unplugged it, blew in it like a Nintendo cartridge, popped it back in. That was a month ago. Works fine. Only time I've had a problem with this server. <laughs> Uh, Sam asked, did I see the YouTube updates? Yeah, I, uh, I updated my terms and conditions to YouTube. They're, they don't really affect my channel. Everyone's losing their mind over it. Um, YouTube is known for their reaction and then overreaction and uh, back and forth on that. What, what's going on right now is uh, FTC versus YouTube. So... YouTube channel owners, is your content dedicated to children? This is a, they're constantly revising this. Please note, there's another revision here. Um, and, this, and this has been going on for a little while. Um, FTC action against YouTube and Google, COPA, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of confusion. And what the problem is, is there's a lot of rules here in America. We actually have some rules on things. And one of them is advertising. Although our advertising laws are pretty uh, poor, they do crack down on the fact that if you make content targeted at kids, it has to be disclosed as such. And people have been coming up all these kids' channels and not actually doing that um, in the way that is compliant with the law. Undoubtedly, there are some political pressures from advertisers, like mainstream advertising, like toy companies, because toy companies can't just do whatever they want, make a commercial to sell a toy. They have to follow the rules. Well, YouTubers have not really had to truly follow them in the same way or were really pushed under the same guidelines. So it's just kind of a um, probably an overreaction that will come back on the other side because, well, hey, whatever. And YouTube is you know, letting it fly because they're making money. There's a lot of content and there's a lot of money to be made on content. There's a lot of advertisers that want to get ads um, targeted to children. So they you know, they're going to learn. Um, it, it's a complicated industry and this is uncharted, ter uncharted territory. We don't have um, anyone else doing this. There's hardly a competitor to scale and scope of YouTube. So the FTC is going to go after them for any of these changes. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, it's a, in, in some ways, if you care about all the legal sides of it, but I'm also not thinking it's the end of YouTube because, well, whatever. Um, it doesn't affect my content directly. I have, I know people who it does. I Yeah, it is it is what it is. Um, so you guys got me curious here. So let's go and uh, exit SSH. Um <laughs> oh, so cat drive. Oh, what do we got here? So we go here and we'll go back over here. So I'm curious now, you guys got me curious how long those hard drives have been running for. So let's, I know the two terabyte ones are going to be the oldest ones in here. So if we go to view disks. ADA zero. How long has ADA zero been doing? So smart control dash A dev ADA zero. This should have some hours in it here at the top. Spin up times. Power on hours. We have four thousand one five oh nine. So it's already outlasted the HP. Well, let's open up a calculator. Uh, slat four thousand hours. I uh, was well, hold on. Why I'm, I'm I am really hours converted to days. <laughs> I'm lazy. 
yeah, 1,729 days. So there we go. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully that helps a little bit there. Uh, I use Windows VPN and I'm not able to connect because I'm not using two network cards. I was NAT with my Windows 2012. Um, have you purchased cheap SAS drives from eBay and what was your mileage? Oh, that's actually interesting. So the, the drives on eBay, uh, I have found drives on eBay with like no hours on them and bought them. So yeah. Oh, I should be drinking while live streaming. It's 8 a.m. and I have to drive home. So I don't feel like starting drinking. I, I I never start drinking. I'm not a day drinker in general. I drink at night if I drink at all. I'm not a big drinker in general. So, um, SAS drives. You can find some of these drives on here. Uh, we'd actually got a deal on them, a really good deal. And uh, the SAS drives we got were still sealed. They weren't even, it said new SAS drives. Um, SAS drive, new. So we actually had some that didn't even have hours on them. Yeah, brand new, right here. So here's a Seagate uh, 600 gig, 15,000 RPM SAS drive, brand new for 50 bucks. You can find some of those on there. Matter of fact, my R710 has a bunch of two and a half drives in it, and they're the 15,000 fast, high RPM drives. Right here, new <laughs> Ultra Stars, uh, 15K for $29. There's a lot of deals on eBay for stuff. Yeah, you. so the thing about them uh, is when you get these drives, uh, what this is, let me give you a little scenario because I've, I've actually got to see this firsthand in large enterprise. My friend worked for a bank, a very large bank, one of the biggest. And they had so many spares of everything. When they bought stuff, they didn't bother buying like five-year next year warranties. They just bought two of everything, one to use, one as spare parts because they thought that was cheaper and they wanted this stuff there. They would buy extra hard drives. And when they, they would have it all as a kit, like with the server, when they would replace a server, they would take that server, all these spare servers that maybe didn't even get turned on and the spare hard drives they bought and just get rid of them all uh, as a recycling that are only, you know, they're four or five years old. So it's time to get rid of them. But yeah, they're just like, here you go, tossing all this stuff. And uh, he worked for them. He's like, yeah, they, the recycling on it was crazy. The enterprise stuff he could just take home sometimes. So, um, and for those of you that sound, saying that sounds wasteful, in some ways it is, but this is what creates these secondary markets. Uh, these companies, losing anything or any downtime cost them more than buying that server. Therefore, it was worth it to them uh, for the financial risk of losing it. Oh, wow, here's a big stack of them. Yeah, there's so many deals on eBay to uh, get enterprise servers like or enterprise drives. Just get, you know, look up some models, look up if you can find some information out of them. But yeah, uh, these are SAS, hot swaps, 16 meg cache, 7200 RPM, two and a half inches here, big pile of them someone has. So there's a lot of deals to be had. There's no doubt about that. <clears> oh, <throat> uh, let's see here. Hey, happy Thanksgiving. I see Brett's on there. Morning stream. Yes, absolutely. Uh, how old is too old for enterprise hardware? When it can't be used for you, when it doesn't run the thing you want to do, it is now too old. Uh, or what are the other things that someone asked me about? Hey, what about, you know, and we'll pull up like the, uh, you've probably seen, I know a lot of people in the home lab still have these. Um, you notice how this auto completes Dell 2950 power consumption. So 2950s. They've been around since 2007. They're actually pretty powerful, but, but man, they, they will warm a room. So this now becomes a different question. Will it run your stuff? And do you mind shelling out for electricity um, at a rate that is incredible uh, when it comes to these? They're not the most power efficient. So some of these old servers, although they may still be relevant in terms of usage, uh, you know, do you have 900 watts to spare to run these things? 
Uh, so yeah, you, they, a lot of these things just pull too many watts. So you have a different problem with them of they just consume too much energy. So yeah, that's, that's really the, the kind of, uh, determination. So n n not, it, there's not really an age that says it's too old. Um, obviously as they get older, statistically, it's an engineering uh, puzzle. You're going to find systems that are going to be more likely to die due to their age. Um, so there's that aspect, but they also get cheaper as they get older. But then you have the power consumption problem because new servers give you more processing power per watt used and actually more storage per watt used. So that's a different type of uh, calculation. And power happens to be relatively inexpensive here in America, but it's not everywhere. So this is this is a concern. Uh, what do we have here? Uh, I don't use Docker in production. I've seen someone ask that. Uh, well, let's let's uh, qualify that. My only production Docker system right here, my forums, it runs in Docker. It's the easiest way to run these forums is in Docker. Therefore, I run it in Docker. So um, that's it. No clients I have are using. I have friends that run Docker. I'm not a Docker expert. Uh, let's see. What else did we have asked? Make a video about consumer SATA plus SSD hybrid approach versus full SAS speed test. There's That's the problem. There's not a massive speed difference between the drives. They're not night and day. You're not going to go, oh my gosh, it's absolutely so much faster as I switch to SAS. There's so many more things that go into that calculation um, in order to make it. So to get your real IOPS, it's that. And by the way, uh, once you go SSD, SAS doesn't matter as much as with the solid state drives. And no matter how fast, if you have 15,000 RPM SAS drives, you're going to get outrun by uh, SSDs. This SSD is non-mechanical, your seek time. Seek time is very important. Seek time is like instantaneous on SSDs. That's why even if you're looking at the raw numbers and trying to do a comparison on an SSD, the seek time is actually what usually for real world applications is going to be the big deal. Um, so that's just something to chew on when it comes to that. Uh, you, Lewis, he uses PF Sense in production and needs to get my help working again. Uh, double that while I was asking your price. Oh, I'm on disability. Yeah. Uh, I One of the reasons I recommend sometimes, and, you know, yeah, we're $200 an hour. And right now there is a Black Friday sale. Let's go and uh, where is that at? Oh, on Twitter probably. PF Sense, and I think I retweeted this. Mm. I seen they had a sale either way. There we go. So only at the store.netgate.com. Uh, and let's actually head over to store.netgate.com. Retweet. Actually, I didn't even read this one yet either. Heart. I'll retweet it. I'm sure it's. I'm sure there's a good reason for this. I like this one. Matter of fact, I have one we're going to be putting in tomorrow, maybe. But uh, let's go back over to home. Do do do. Uh, we want the routers right here. One of the reasons I tell people, and you know, don't take this the wrong way, Lewis, but it's one of those things, like. It's $200 an hour to talk to one of my technicians, or you can just buy a working PF Sense for $179. Um, it, these work right out of the box. They're great. Uh, they're secure out of the box. So unless you do something to make a PF Sense insecure, the default config is secure. And these are great little boxes uh, for it. And jump up here if you actually have a speed requirement that exceeds the 700 megs that that can route at you need full gig speed the 3100 is a working out of the box pf sense um, for 399 and i think it's funny people accuse me of being like a paid shill by then i'm like i make nothing off telling you to do this i'm trying to solve people's headache because so many of the headaches and we've been paid to troubleshoot stuff that turned out to be bad hardware on more than one occasion. So someone spent with us two hours of our time they bought to spend $400 to find out that they had a bad network card. <laughs> I'm like, you could go buy another box for what you spent. And you know, bad hardware or people who wanna choose odd hardware, people always ask, use the Intel is what I tell people. And I'm like, yeah, 
absolutely, the Intel will give you the least amount of problems. If someone points out you use a Chelsea. I'm like, yes. And I've, I think I've got a video where I talk about some of the bugs with it uh, versus using the Intel. There's never an issue, especially with the PF Sense. BSD supports Intel better. Uh, does any of the PF Sense hardware support 10G? Lots of it does. So PF Sense and the same question, someone asked me this the other day, and I probably, you know, I'm going to pull up the messenger so I don't have to dig for it again. People ask me this question a lot. And, I, you know, uh, we go over here and we'll pull this up because we've been on the eBay topic. Um, and we'll pull this up. And put this here. So two things. One, free NAS and EF Sense, both based on FreeBSD. Intel, hugely well-supported on FreeBSD. So Intel X520 SR2 dual port right here, $84. The uh, person that was messaging was in the UK. That's why it's a UK link, but we can uh, go over here and uh, go to just uh, not the UK one, but hey, whatever, search whatever country you're in. Oh, crap. Use mouse over to zoom. No, 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 no. Copied way too much. We'll just do the SR2. I'm too lazy to type. I'm willing to do this because I don't want to type. <laughs> I really should just type. I'm just going to hold the backspace key. There we go. All right. You can find this car for uh, previously enjoyed for 50 bucks US. Actually, let's go for make sure we have a buy it now option in here. So we'll say buy it now. There we go. 80 bucks US, 75 US. And what am I bringing this up for? BSD kernel interfaces menu. Yes, these are supported. These are the... Uh, Intel XF and SR series, which are 10 gigabit SFP adapters. So yes, it's uh, completely supported. Um, whether the question was for FreeNAS, whether the question was for PFSense, absolutely. Now back to the PFSense site, they have 10 gig routers as well. Um, if you want to go with one of their systems that supports 10 gig, uh, this one's got 10 gig ports on it from the rip. So the XG1537, uh, which we'll look at the PFSense one. Also, I think they have on here. There we go. They have a Chelsea card on it too. That's interesting. But here's this system. Um, and we'll roll down to the specs here. Hey, look, it's got, you know, 14 gigs of routing. And you can put an add-on card in there. And But right here's the two 10 gig ports. So 10 gig SFP plus ports. I'm willing to bet those are Intel in there. They do do a lot of Intel. This Intel's well supported. So yes, absolutely, it can it can absolutely write and read and function at 10 gigs, provided you have the network card. And as long as you go Intel, it should work. But um, it does work with more than Intel, obviously, because I thought that was interesting. Here they have a uh, Chelsea T520 adapter in here as well. So it does support more than Intel. You just have to figure out which cards are supported in BSD, and pretty much. Um, it should work fine with uh, PFSense and FreeNAS. Well, uh, let's see. Could you go over HBA section and set up in FreeNAS? Get an LSI card would probably be my uh, bet. And I'll let you, let me show you how to cheat. Let, let's let's cheat here. You could spend a lot of time, but we're actually, will it free NAS? One, there is the ultimate build discussion called will it free NAS? And there's a million, million responses to that question in here. Um, then this is the cheating way to do it. Free NAS server. And then you go here. Then you go for one of these giant chassis. And you look at the specs and you figure out what did they integrate in here? Right here. LSI 9211. There we go. JBOD module. So now let's go here. Copy. We know it works with FreeNAS. That's why they're selling it. Unix Surplus. Awesome people. I've uh, purchased some servers from them before because they've had some really good deals on FreeNAS. Now we just find the LSI controller and we can find the LSI controller, find the same model, and now build it for our FreeNAS. So um, 
there's a way to cheat and do it. Just look at what they're selling. Uh, Unix Surplus is a reputable place I have purchased from them. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but the LSI cards are well supported. Matter of fact, um, dig around in here. Build your own 2U 12 base Super Micro Free NAS server. I'm willing to bet when we dig around in here. Oh, look, another LSI, right? Dual LGA, where's the controller? LSI 920, uh, 928i HBA controller. You're going to find that the LSIs and specific models already have it. So I recommend though, I mean, you can build it yourself, but you can buy some pretty uh, good bare bones systems with no drives in them like this. I mean, this is huge. This is actually very similar to one we have right now on it, uh, in ours. Um, here we go. It's big giant server with 2.1 gigahertz, 16 gig and 24 trays. And uh, yeah, there you go. For three forty nine, dollars hard to beat. And then, you know, hunt down the hard drive deal you're looking for or go shuck some hard drives. Uh, that's always popular because SATA will fit in a SAS and away you go. Oh, here's another one. Here's a, a 12 base server. And if we dug down, what do you want to guess? It has an LSI in it. Uh... Oh, this is AMD Optron. Stay away from those AMD Optrons. I'm not even going to look further at this one. And the reason I say that, those things, I have a board. I don't know what to do with Someone gave it to me, and I realized why. It's also like several hundred watts, and it's slow. So <laughs> it's just crazy. There's also these guys. They make some cool stuff. The Storinators, if you haven't seen them, uh, you can buy build and price their solution we'll start with a basic one build so motherboard processor ram power supply um does it tell you what controller they're using i'm gonna bet they're using an lsi but same thing these these are like if you wanted to go new another option as well oh let's see I'm using uh, PFSense on Hyper-V and one of the network cards that was on a WAN card. Can you help me with the Windows VPN on issue? I don't know anything about Hyper-V when it comes to PFSense. I've had people tell me they have problems with it, so I don't run it. I run it on hardware because that works. Um, I don't... I've had people tell me it works great. I've had people tell me it's a real pain in the butt to get uh, PFSense working properly in Hyper-V. I've never run it, so uh, you would be paying me to guess. I don't know. Uh, what do I recommend for a WLAM for PFSense? Intel cards, I get if that's the question. <laughs> Hello from Norway. Awesome. Um, load balancing versus failover. You can do either one. Uh, latency is sometimes a reason. Usually the primary internet provider is faster, but it's, it's an arbitrary change. So if the internet provider, for example, a lot of our clients that have it, they have a high-speed fiber line that has very low latency, and then they have a DSL backup. The reason we don't do load balancing with them is the DSL has a higher latency. So there's technically going to be slower connections if I tried to load balance them. So we just push everything out over there, and if it fails, then flip everything over to the other one. Um, also, there sometimes can be confusion uh, on apps that have – matter of fact, their apps have locks to IP addresses. Uh, so there can be some drama there. That's rare, but it does happen. Still going with PAA since Cape Technologies took over? Yep. I don't have a reason not to. I don't trust any VPN company. I, I Even though I recommend PAA, I don't think anyone's any better or worse. I trust zero VPN companies. So um, I was going to do a video on it, and I didn't get around to it yet. It was on my to-do list to talk about the Cape takeover. I, all it does is put people in thought spirals of, but can I trust any VPN company? The short answer to that, no, you can't. Um, you're kicking the, the, the layer of trust down the road a bit that they won't sell your data. Um, if you're torrenting, if you're uh, copying movies, sure, use a VPN. Um, it's not likely the MPAA has pull with the VPN companies, no matter which one they are. That's all you're really doing is going, I don't want to I don't want to do this, or I want to be able to watch uh, a show that's uh, restricted to my country. There's reasons to use a VPN. The rest of them, if you're doing something illegal online, stop. <laughs> if you worry about your ISP selling your data, worry about the VPN companies selling your data. Why wouldn't they do it? Um, 
And your data is only has limited value of worth based on all they know is what IP addresses you're going to. Uh, I don't worry about it that much. Yeah, the 7100 has uh, 10 gig connections as well. I forgot to bring that up. So, uh, what are my thoughts on UFW in regard to firewalls? You have to, you have to expand that answer. I don't understand the question. You just want to know: Do I think it's a good thing? Yes. Turn it on. Um, it'd be nice if there are motherboards embedded with AMD Ryzen processor. There are. Um, there is a couple of them. Matter of fact, let me find it in one of these screens here. Uh, nope, not that one. I think I retweeted it, but I'll, I probably find it faster in my other notes. Um, that didn't go well. That's not it. Oh, it's gone. It's gone. Uh, DIY budget. There we go. This guy. He chose uh, Intel Atom before. I thought it was his. Let me find it. I think he built an AMD one, CPU and motherboard. Yeah, here we go. So this is a Asus Prime Ryzen 2 AM4 board. And I do they do make some embedded ones. Where is, there is some, uh, Newegg has, is easier to find them. Uh, our, oh, uh, Sam Sheridan, is Cape Technologies known for pushing adware? Yeah, they did. One, uh, back to the VPN topic. When you set up a VPN, don't use their crappy software. Why would you do that? Uh, you're asking for problems. Uh, the other side of that is the adware issue. Was it Cape? Was it the company? I don't know. Uh, VC companies, such as Cape, they're in a the business to make money. They realized that lost them business. Would they do it again? Probably not. I don't know. It's a guess. Uh, I never install the VPN provider software. All of my connections to my VPNs are manually done. They are done without me loading any of their crappy utilities uh, and software downloads. So if you're going to do that, you're asking for trouble. I don't care what VPN company it is. I don't trust third party software. Uh, micro AT. X. Or is it the embedded boards? I'm like, yeah, let's just go to motherboards. AMD motherboards. Is it the UDTX? Or they have an embedded option here. I don't look for motherboards very often, so bear with me here. So somewhere in here, there should be one. There's a few different um, small AMD form factor embedded ones. I don't know where they are though. There's CPU socket. Refurbish CPU. There's a couple of motherboard manufacturers that make it. Oh, here's this, people are asking about this too. This is the same one that the FreeNAS was in if you're looking to build a, a small uh, case. These are kind of cool too. This is the same as the, very similar, not actually the same, but similar to the FreeNAS one. Anyways, I'm not going to wander around on that. Um, yes, the videos take a lot of time and effort, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, there's a whole lot of it. So uh, how's the Ponagachi doing? I haven't really played much with the Ponagachi lately, uh, so I've kind of, eh. It, it was fun. Um, 
it's novel. I, I'm afraid to do YouTube videos on it because if you do YouTube videos on uh, certain things about Wi-Fi, you can get your channel banned. So I'm kind of, I, I don't know how much further I want to take it on a YouTube video. Um, it's I played with it. We we had our fun with it. I don't know what we're going to do with it now. Uh, it sits around doing not much. <laughs> Uh, so everyone thinks there's some magic for Wi-Fi surveys. So we did the bowling alley. Maybe I should do a Wi-Fi survey video because people overthink the hell out of this. And then also a lot of people tell me I'm wrong. And I, 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 I'm laughing all the way to the bank about being wrong. Um, that's, that's fine. And especially some of these projects we sold, um, we, you know, we, we installed 300 Wi-Fi access points is one of the bigger ones we did. And we didn't use survey tools. And people are like, what? You don't? You didn't go buy some crazy survey tool that will be inaccurate and not very helpful? Pretty much. Um, what we do, and the bowling alley is a perfect example, is we brought ones with us. We set them up and uh, made sure we had the range we wanted. If you want to do an accurate survey, bring the device you plan to install, put it on a post or a pole, or mount it to the place you, roughly where you're going to put it, and then go use your phone or a device and measure whether or not you have signal in the area the client wants signal. You are done. You have now accomplished this. So we set up the device at the area in the bowling alley where they wanted it. We used the laptop and we said, do you want access here? Yes. Okay. We have, uh, you know, 80% signal here, 20% here. The signal went down to 20%. You need another access point over here. So then we moved it over there and we found the access point and so on and so forth. So it's just... <laughs> um, it's it's going to be a, a video that's um, me being kind of sarcastic, but yeah, I, I don't use a bunch of expensive tools. I actually use my laptop uh, with WaveMod on it. And uh, matter of fact, the Wi-Fi tool is actually really nice that uh, Unify provides. It's free, the free app from Unify for measuring Wi-Fi. So between the phone and my laptop, I can get a pretty good idea of how good the Wi-Fi is when we put things out. So uh, let's see here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Would you run ARM servers when mature enough? Absolutely. Matter of fact, the new kernel, um, so OMG Ubuntu, the new kernel, they did a great job of a bunch of arm so uh doo -doo -doo -doo. right here linux 5.4 also introduces early support for intel tiger Lake hardware arm fans will appreciate the inclusion of mainline linux support for the snapdragon 855 not many boards out there for that yet but a bunch of arm based laptops snapdragon 835 system on a chip supported by linux 5.4 asus novago hp Envy, lenovo mix 630 Da, 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 da. So yeah, I'm excited. It is going to take a while before these really uh, get even more popular, but they're coming. And uh, with kernel support comes more uh, boards. With more boards comes more kernel support and the cycle will continue. So um, do I like the new Kelly undercover mode? I think it's novel. I've never needed to do that. I think it's cool that they have it. I've never needed to do it. So um, definitely, definitely fun, definitely novel, not super exciting needed though uh, for me. But I liked, I tweeted it because I'm like, that's cool that they have that. So that's definitely a thing. <laughs> um, so you have... Multiple streams in and out of network 24-7, 30, 40 megabit up and down. The 5100 should be able to handle that. They have uh, over at NetGate. I got a lot of windows open. Oh, actually, did this thing update? Mm -mm -mm. We got distracted actually doing this video here. Hey, it's all up to date. Cool. This is uh, not asking me for updates anywhere. All up to date. Sweet. Look at all the stuff in the hub here. Um, go to their appliances. 
compare specs and speed. Look at all this specs and speed here. SG5100 um, can do IPsec VPN of 923 and 1.8 gig on the firewall. So not bad here. And this is iMix traffic over here. Um, so this should be able to handle it without, without a huge issue. Um, if you're a little bit more, I, I've, I've pushed some people because if they ever want 10 gigabit in there, this will not do 10 gig and this one will. So there's some advantage to uh, bumping it up a bit to the 7100 if that's what you need is 10 gig. Do you need 10 gig? If not, yeah, if you're only doing 100, you should be perfectly fine with the 5100 and you're not planning on going there. So, yeah. Um Cybertruck. Oh, I, yeah, we didn't talk enough about that. Really getting a Cybertruck. Yes. I hope um, I hope it's ready sooner than later because I don't know when I'm getting it because obviously uh, it's a couple years out because I want the highest end model. But yes, I did order the Cybertruck. I do have um, the reservation set for that. And uh, I like it. I, I like all the the hoopla the um the showmanship of elon putting this all together because he has not spent any ad money and even whether you love it or hate it he is absolutely uh dominating dominating the news right now the the haters are got him in the news the people who are fans have in the news it's polarizing um and that's one of those things yeah i retweeted lego's response to lego's done it bmw has joined in the fun all these things are great. Now, a little bit of background on this. I work a lot with automotive suppliers. Matter of fact, I want to get an interview with one of my friends who has worked in the steel industry for the last 30 years. I think it might be kind of fun to talk to him about this. The reason that we currently don't build the trucks with uh, stainless steel is because stainless steel, 301 cold rolled steel, I believe, Elon didn't say specifically, but a lot of speculation is this 301 cold rolled steel. That's really hard to work with. That's a very hard, difficult steel to uh, try to use presses to make. Because every time you try to do stuff with cold rolled steel, it turns out looking like origami or a cyber truck. That's the, so I think what Elon did was take the challenge of working with it and said, well, no one wants to do it because they can't do rounded edges as well. Why don't we just get rid of the rounded edges and turn this piece of steel that is actually great to build with in terms of reliability and endurance and strength. It's just bad to work with for making rounded fenders and, and build a damn truck with it. I think that's just genius. So it's kind of fun. It's just kind of a fun thing to uh, look at that from the aspect of it. And of course, um, all the other stupid showmanship, it, but it's funny of dragging a truck around, et cetera. Electric vehicles have more torque than gasoline engines by the nature of their design. Therefore, yeah, they're going to drag everything at, at zero mile an hour. There's definitely going to be a advantage uh, that they have from the pure physics and engineering of it. So it's going to be fun. Um, we need something besides carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is not the future in its current state. And that's because of the fatigue of it. So that's a big problem with it. Uh, someone says, I bought an Alpha uh, and the driver's GitHub equivalent. You don't seem to be able to work with the latest kernel in Papa West's Aircrack NG uh, driver's 30 meg suggestion. I don't know. I'm not sure. I've not done a lot. I've not had problems with it, so I don't know. Uh, is the PS something in a web UI also update the OS? Yeah, everything's updated through the web UI. It updates all the back end. That's well, the web UI is just a front end for the back end. So hopefully that helps. Um, how many servers and UPSs can a Cybertruck haul? quite what was it 10,000 pounds in the bed whatever the number was uh so <laughs> that's definitely a thing yeah i actually already talked to the guys they actually said it's going to be super easy to wrap so the people that wrap my car uh said wrapping the cyber truck is not going to be a problem so make sure there's nothing personal in here and we drag something over for those of you that haven't seen the wrap on my car, this is what it looks like when the sun hits it. And uh, the people that did the wrap on my car are going to do 
Uh, they have no problem. They're excited. They're like, the truck's going to be so easy to wrap because <laughs> it doesn't have any of the rounded edges that my car has. So it's going to be a lot different. So, yeah, it's definitely um, definitely a thing. Um, and when you look up close at it, this is an up-close look. You can see when the sun, isn't it wild? It's just all these little specks inside of it. Uh, the wrap is called um, 3M Flip Psychedelic. And the weirdest part about this wrap is, let me find that picture, because this is what blows people's minds. So this is what it looks like under parking lot lights at night, right? So yeah, the wrap is called uh, 3M Flip Psychedelic. So 3M Psychedelic Flip Vinyl. It's just, it was, I couldn't resist it. It's just so wild looking. But, uh, so this is parking lot lights. Like any uh, type of lights that are direct do that. But watch when the clouds come out. This is so cool. Where is it at? I got to find that photo. Because people, it's, it's so different looking. Here, same car with no direct light. So now ambient light, you can't even tell. So yeah, it just turns completely gray. So when it's cloudy out, I just have a gray car, like plain old boring gray. There's nothing about it. Uh, hey, right here, here's another picture. This is, uh, it was raining. I plugged it in behind my office. It was actually a, a kind of uh, a little bit of frost on it here. It was when the weather started changing before the snow came. Once again, completely gray. <laughs> So it is interesting to see how dramatically different they look. And I did do the interior. I'm, gonna, I'm waiting on the people so they haven't got me the video of them wrapping it. When they give me the video of them wrapping, I'm going to do a whole wrap video. And I've talked to him about like, uh, you know, hey, I'll make this video. They asked me to make it. I said yes. And I've been waiting now like a month for them to get me the video that they took. So I was out of town, so I couldn't do any video of them actually wrapping it. So, <laughs> So there's... See, it's interesting too. Um, let me find. Uh, I'm going to be talking soon. I got a. I have a list of Tesla videos. I just got to figure out when to do them. As I have this too, so I can show you uh, how the charging works on it. And everything else. I've been waiting to use it for a while. Where's the login for their stuff? I don't log in very often. There we go. No. Oh. Eh, I do have a login. I got to I got to find the login. What is it called? E-motor works. There we go. Uh, Ooh, -hoo, charging right now. Yeah, go ahead and add. They changed their site, and I have, that's why I haven't logged in in a while, so I couldn't remember the link since they updated it. So, um, electric cars aren't the future. Electric cars are the now. So they're kind of interesting. Savings of $701. Uh, that sounds about right. So power, uh, kilowatt hours, your usage. Is, where's my total usage? Does it have energy statement maybe? Here's all the power I've put back in my car. Uh, what are we? 74 cents here. 315. What the, it's amazing how little it costs to do this. So a uh, total of this many kilowatt hours. So DTE energy prices. 
DT energy is our uh, per kilowatt. So DT residential normally pays six point cents for the first seventeen months, eight point two cents after that. So, and all customers also pay four point two kilowatt charging habit. So let's get the total cost here. So this is what we need, and it's also I also charge off peak. So. Do, do, do. So let's just say it's uh, 10 cents per kilowatt hour to make the statement easy. So 583, pull up the old trusty calculator, uh, times 10. Uh, well, actually, that would be 0. 0.10. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so actually... Uh, per per kilowatt calculator. There we go. Kilowatts. So what's my kilowatts on this was uh, 585. So at 12 cents, calculate. Oh, does it have electric car in here? Close on electric fan heater. No. I got to figure out how many hours a day. Uh, I don't know. 11 cents here. Yeah, power is cheap here. So basically, what you figure out... Um, calculate. Yeah, that's not what I'm looking for. Not It's kilowatt hours over what? Is this a week? Total kilowatt hours. I need to know... There we go. There's a total for that many days, monthly energy usage. So this month I've used that many kilowatts, but I'm not actively using that much. So I'm trying to figure out exactly. These sound right though. Yeah. two fifty nine, three nine, five dollars Okay. Now, yeah, this makes sense. So these are how much it costs me to drive. And the car is so efficient essentially so i have in here i'm trying to remember where you put it somewhere i when i set this up it has my energy company and it calculates the rates etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh, basically what's happening here is it's saying yeah it only costs you five dollars to charge the car there's actually i might be a little bit off because i know i charge some of it on peak and it doesn't distinguish a difference between the two of them but what you end up having here is it costs roughly eight dollars for you to drive 300 miles and i don't drive a lot well i kind of do um but it's really efficient to use electric cars so you go every 300 miles i spend about eight or nine dollars in electricity to go 300 miles so every fill up but you're not filling up you're not running the car all the way to empty and filling it up right now i pulled it in it had about an hour of charging to get it back up so i put just a little bit of kilowatts in there i'm going to do i got to really get down and get the math um, that's what's taking me time and why i haven't done a full video on this but you can also see on some days i don't even charge the car um or i charge it very little when you start looking at how much i do each time it's it's kind of interesting uh yeah okay it does have my kilowatt cost right here at 10. so let's even say i charged at peak and we'll bump it up to 12. Do a recalculation. And you still see I have not spent a ton of money in electricity charging the car. So electric cars are very, very efficient. They're very um, practical. Well, getting more practical, but it still depends on your use case. So I'm really happy. I got about 8,000 miles on my Tesla. Really happy with it overall. But it comes down to what's your use case. I have a friend who hated it, having a Tesla, and that's because... All of his use case was, I want to drive long distances. Well, now you have a problem, especially if those long distances uh, are places where there's nowhere to charge and you don't your destination doesn't have a charger. So let's go Tesla superchargers. And uh, if we look up here for Tesla superchargers, here's a few down here. There's some up here as well. Um, where's a map of them? The car knows where they're at better than this does, but there's not one up in Alpena. So if I go visit my friends in Alpena, then I can't 
I, I got to figure out where to charge at. The last charger is actually in Gaylord and there's none all the way here in Northern Michigan. So if I bought a Tesla and my use case for my Tesla was to go up to Alpine all the time, I would have a real problem because I have to charge here, go here, and there's nowhere to charge. There's actually only one charging station. It's a slow charge station in Atlanta. So there's a lot of ground to cover. So it comes down to, is the car right for you? That's one of the things I always like to tell people. If you have specific use cases, it may not be right for you. Yes, I do have a Model 3. Oh, I want to answer the Ubuntu question in real sense. Uh, I've been wanting to move over to an Ubuntu variation really for a while. Is there any hardware acceleration for the roadmap uh, for any web browser? I don't know. I don't think about it, uh, so I'm not sure on that one. Does the battery work worse in cold weather, and do you need more power for heat? Yes. So you lose, and this is where uh, it kind of sucks, and I'm going to pull this up. So in the winter, you get... The frosty battery warning. Let me find that little picture of it. Uh, the frosty battery warning is, um, doo -doo 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 -doo, where did it go? There we go. What this is, is a system letting you know that um, the battery's cold. This is how much the battery is charged. There's 161 miles available in the battery, but this is the part of the battery that's unavailable to you because it's cold out compound that problem with the fact that the battery uh, just gives you less range. So, because you're using the heat and everything else. So my car that goes 300 miles might actually only travel about 240 miles on a full charge, depending on how hot you run the heat. Heat takes a lot out of the car to uh, make it go. That's, <laughs> it's a challenge. Fun note, and I haven't done a video on this yet. Um, is we were playing with it, people do ask the question of, does the traction control work? Oh yeah. So the traction control on this is outright amazing. So my wife was driving the car, this is 100% on ice, and she floors it. Actually, we'll get right to the part where she floors it. So she's in here, and that's it. This car will go zero to 60 in four seconds, and that's as much as it takes off on ice. The traction control is absolutely uh, crazily uh, good on it. So that's been kind of a cool feature of the Tesla is how, uh, how it handles in the snow has been great. The downside of it is, yes, it uses more electricity, but the upside electricity, as someone's pointing out right now, electricity is way cheaper here in America than it is in Sweden. So <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh... Is it possible to make a replication snapshot task from a free NAS system to a Synology? Not really. Do you, you, you can't just do, um, uh, you can't just drop a snapshot on there. For, so ZFS snapshots to ZFS snapshots, fine. It has to be another system running ZFS. It doesn't have to be free NAS, but it has to be the same version of ZFS. Uh, Synology doesn't run ZFS, so it won't move over there. Do I get range anxiety? No, my wife does constantly. We can't get in the car and go anywhere that's 15 minutes away without my wife saying, should we take my Jeep? <laughs> so that's uh, definitely my wife's range anxiety drives me crazy. Uh, I don't know why she has it all the time. We've never been stranded. We've never gotten stuck anywhere in the car. And we've now taken it on three road trips that were pretty far that we had to supercharge on because you know we we went the whole we went like a 300 mile road trip and you know i stopped at the supercharger for 20 minutes that was it that's my um my exciting or less than exciting story which is on my youtube channel of uh, that trip uh, of my road trip uh it's awesome that you don't have to worry about replacing a timing belt at 70,000 or 80,000 miles well interesting so um the model 3 if we go over here, model three uh, motor, and we'll, there's some people that did some teardown. No, there's no timing belt. Uh, this is what the motor looks like. It's really, really simplistic. This unit weighs in the 100 pound range. It's not super uh, heavy. They do have, but you don't have to maintain it. Uh, right here is the model three oil filter, and it does have an oil filter, but it does not need to be changed. Like the life of the car, that should be fine. That's just to collect any particulates. So 
It's um, it's kind of cool that you don't really have anything else in there. The other thing that makes them so interesting is you're looking at the entirety of it now. These gears, that's it. Uh, these guys did a video on it too. So we have the differential right here. You know, there's your output shafts for the differential. So one, two, three, four, because there's this uh, pump gear right here. That's it. And then the differential has a couple planetary gears. I think there's like about 12 gears in a Tesla. That's it. You have to get 12 gears right. It's amazing. Um, oh, here's a, here's a Tesla with a million miles on it and what the gears look like after a million miles. They're so simple. That's one of the things that makes them so uh, reliable is there's just not much to go wrong. Uh, it's a statistics number. This is an engineering equation. This is just a math equation. You ask if electric cars are reliable. You have to only get, and we are in the advanced levels of manufacturing compared to what we were 100 years ago, uh, we have to only get a few parts right in a car that's made of electric uh, motors because electric motors just don't need to have a lot of parts. Therefore, there's a lot going on. Let's go and look at a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, my Chevy, actually, uh, Scion is a lot, the last car I had. Dig into this, uh, tear down. When you start digging into an automatic transmission, uh, well, we'll just put automatic transmission here. Now I was hoping to find a, uh, from a standpoint of gearing in them. There's substantially more gears. There we go. When you look at a cutaway of these, you can see the complexity in parts that are inside of here. And then this is the valve body system that's underneath it. Then this is what those valve bodies look like uh, in practice. So you can see there's a lot to it. So then we can also then say, uh, we'll go for something uh, Ford. Same thing here. You look at the way these are built, the level of complexity that goes into them. So now you just have an engineering equation from reliability. You, you have that so few parts to go wrong that the count of parts, the lower the count of parts, the more reliable. The less lines of code there are in anything, it is more easier to audit. It's going to be more reliable. Um, it's going to be an easier project to manage. That rule applies to the mechanical world as well. If you have a ton of moving parts in motion, especially when you start thinking about dual overhead cams, which is what right here with the Ford, and, uh, Ford Triton V10 engine, dual overhead cams. Uh, we have two cam guides. We have two cams on top and there's a smaller chain, if I'm not mistaken. They have an overhead cam and I believe it's a dual overhead cam. So there's a secondary one. If I had to guess, let me look into this because now I'm curious. Does he have an over top view of the motor? Broke down. It... It, it just is a lot of complexity in these. I mean, they're, they're works of art, but that being said right here. Yeah, that looks like a second cam on top. Matter of fact, that's a balancer. Uh, I see the counterbalancer on the other side. You start digging into how complicated they are. It's, yeah, it's, it's so simple once you go electric. So uh, life gets a lot simpler. And some of these guys, it's a level of uh, people that hate electric cars, which I'm not even a hater of gasoline cars, but they're, they think I hate them or some arguing about it. But some of them are trying to justify the fact that they know how to do these complicated things and they don't like how simple it is. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, right. So it's the gearbox oil on there does not... Uh, get contaminated like a normal engine does. Therefore, it doesn't need to be changed. You just have some uh, potential particulates that could end up in there. So they put a filter on it to filter out any particulates that may build up, but there's generally not any. Also, um, Tesla uses a, um, a uh, they're, they're limited, they don't have a limited slip differential. And that's that's an important distinction for them. They use all braking for their uh, limited slip system. Therefore, there's also not any particulates that get into the engine from that or, or the motor from that. So 
Yeah, hybrids are a pain in the butt because of more parts. So <laughs> it's like me trying to use the terminal as much as I can. So I think I may have talked about this before. Um, let me find one of my old things on here. I am a huge gearhead. Like I've been building cars and working on them probably as long as, if not before I was in the computers. So that's definitely, uh, where is that picture? I was looking for some of the custom, I've built a lot of custom cars. So it's been a big part of my background, building engines, building custom cars. All right, here we go. Find that right photo here. So this was one of the Chevys I built before from a long time ago. I think I've probably showed this on a live stream before and talked about it. Like my history is a lot of car building. I grew up in a whole family that did this stuff. So I'm I'm a completely familiar with and happy to have electric because of the complexities of tuning those. I am still good at tuning an old Chevy motor. So uh, definitely within my wheelhouse of things that I've been doing for a very, very long time. Right now, I spend most of my time on, um, I still haven't replaced these, but I might at some time replace some of my motorcycles with electric. So that's definitely, <laughs> uh, where'd he go here? My old Hondas. I think I got a picture of one of them I tore apart. I got a picture of them. These are the old Hondas that I ride. These are 1970s uh, Hondas. And uh, so I still, I've rebuilt, uh, not completely rebuilt, but I've redone an electrical on one of them. Um, it's it's fun to me. It's like I keep my skills sharp working on these old ones because uh, they still have a mechanical point system in them. And not everyone knows how to work on mechanical points. I still, I, it's a labor of love doing all that. Tearing down motorcycles and all that fun stuff. Anyways, where did they, I thought I had a, oh, and for those of you who ask if I ride in winter, absolutely. I don't care how much snow there is, as long as I can keep it going, I usually do some winter riding. <laughs> and I love the sound of these things. They have such a brilliant sound to me. I think this one I have running. That's my carburetor got iced up. I had to sit and let it heat up some more. I think it was like eight degrees outside. <laughs> That's what I do on my days off, for those of you wondering. But I'm not playing with firewalls. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, decatted and removed the flaps from some of the sport, sport bikes. Yeah, there might be some reason to that. Um, what else do you guys want me to talk about? I was debating about doing this before. Is that, if you get me on the car topic, I if I go to a car show, I am spending some time there. There is no doubt. I I get real into it. <laughs> so, I mean, I could babble on about cars I built and cars I've owned and all kinds of fun stuff. Matter of fact, I've only ever built I'll, one last off topic thing, but I'll show you guys a picture of it because it was cool. Um, I've only ever built one tuner car. Why is my internet so slow? We having internet issues here today? Is the stream working good? I got a warning on the stream now. Maybe my internet's not working as good as I'd like. Nope, I got good internet. Just Facebook's not opening. Facebook's going slow. Oh, well. But uh, I had a couple pictures of a tuner car I built from a while ago. Oh, well, not a big deal. Not that relevant. Um, I have been working on this. This is one of my projects I was going to finish and got distracted. Maybe I'll finish it from home today because um, it's Thanksgiving. I got to be, I'm supposed to be at the house at some point in time. My wife will be complaining. Let's go to my storage, go to pools. And we have Unify Video VM. What could this be? So what we've got here, and I need to go over back to virtual machines. Oh, how do I make the Wi-Fi access point uh, portable? 
No, I grab a cord and plug it in. It's way easier. I mean, I I see these people going through that. I mean, unless I'm doing an outdoor engagement, um, how do I? I don't need to make it portable. I can just pl- the uh, most of the places that I go have electricity, so <laughs> so I use their plug and get a long uh, network cable to put it where I want to go. So pretty, don't overthink it. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't install a USG Pro for it. It's an old model. I don't. We just don't use Unify uh, routers. They're just too basic. Every time anyone has a question or has a problem or needs an, uh, needs something more advanced, they instantly fall flat on their face. Invest your money into something better. Hey, Grayson. Uh, I hope you're having a good turkey, techie turkey day. I am. Uh, Thanksgiving dinner by myself. Uh, bone out ribs, mashed potatoes, deviled eggs, and that sounds amazing. Ah, the loved ones have to work tonight. Yeah, that hap- That does sometimes work out that way. Uh, I was wondering if you add URLs to firewall aliases and PFSense is the right way to get an IP address update automatically. Hoffman of the update. Uh, I don't know. I never do it that way. I'm not sure. I I, I have no idea, Jimbo. No ham and turkey. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully it helps. So uh, let's talk real quick about this. What am I doing here? So we are going to build this guest operating system, Linux, Unify. Unify video server, why not? I don't need to start a boot though. My drives are encrypted at boot, so I don't have them start at boot. Virtual CPUs. Let's give it eight CPUs and uh, eight gigs of RAM. Next. Use existing disks like Zval. There we go. Next. IGB zero. That actually, I think we want to attach to CXB because that's my... um, what do you call it? Uh, CXP0 is the 10 gig connection. That is the main connection for this. Next, choose media. FreeNAS does have VNs built in. I don't use them very often. They have issues. They're, they work, but they're not wonderful. They, uh, they can be challenging to work with. Submit. All right. Now, the first problem that I'm going to fix before the problem even begins is, uh, oh, cancel, not that one. Go here to devices. We go to VNC. We're going to go to edit. I already know it crashes unless you put it at 800, 600. There's the first problem. <laughs> so uh, save. Uh, is there any good cash, custom ROMs for the Unify YSS stuff? I've never looked. I've never needed a custom ROM for it. I assume you mean custom, not costume. Because, but I haven't seen either, so. <laughs> uh, we are all system administrated, and I'm trying, and I am sure everyone is itching to know how to hide ASN numbers, especially when you are browsing from a VPN. I don't know how you, you can't, you just, when you browse from a VPN, you have the VPN's ASN. So I don't know what what the question is. You, you if you use the uh, if you use a VPN, you end up assuming the ASN of the VPN. I, I don't know if that helps you at all. Because I don't understand the question, to be honest with you. Start power on. See if the magic works. VM memory. Awesome. Here we go. Do I do any red teaming? Not professionally. I have friends that do that professionally. Um, I'm not a red teamer. I definitely hang out with some, and it's a great time. (laughs) VNC. Here we go. And we're going to go through an install. Actually, you know what? Because I uh, abort the installation. Yes. 
I want to see if there's uh, an image on this right now. There might be. Let's find out. Because there might be, let me see if I can just say boot from hard drives. Uh, she will stop the VM, so power off. Come on. I'll stop. Yeah, we couldn't do a power off. It actually do a stop. Edit. Where do you set the boot order in here? You can see all right away the problems you can have with this disk. So it should try to boot from disk first. So I, I think, yeah, order 103. There's, there's a lot of trickiness to this. So let's go back over here and it does need to be powered back on. It does not have an image. It is set to boot to hard drive first. So um, let's see, what do we have here? Yeah, VNC inside the browser. That is how this works. And it's using the Beehive system. It's getting better, but this is for people that are familiar with like how powerful Zen Orchestra, Proxmox, or any of the other modern uh, hypervisor systems are, you're going to be a little disappointed by what's over in FreeNAS. It's kind of basic. And it has a use case of, hey, I have a FreeNAS server and I want to run something in here. And we're going to use this as an example. So we're going to run install a Debian 10. I called it Unify VM. And it's going to run my Unify video server. We're going to move it over inside of here. Now, the whole thing we're doing it this way, this is the use case for it. A basic VM that is not mission critical per se, but needs a lot of storage because it's going to store a video. Um, and I don't want, to, I'm, I'm going to be foregoing all the fun features I get, like, you know, easy, simple snapshots and uh, nice intuitive interfaces because it's super kind of basic, uh, but it works. So, yeah. Uh, do I send Christmas cards to clients? We do not. We've never done that. Um, I, it feels like I should send Christmas cards to clients, but I never have. It, probably a great marketing idea. Uh, I, if I... Uh, let's see, Eastern. Then you can see it runs through pretty simple. Yeah, sim it probably is similar to what they're using in the browser. It's... Um, manual? Oh, yeah, it's got a bunch of crap on there, so I need to... Go back. Go back, and I want to uh, guided partition. Use entire disk. Yes, just blow it away. There we go. Because I did have something I was working on that I broke. <laughs> so it does, it does require a reset. There we go. Now... Now it's going to do the partition and do all the stuff, and it's running in FreeNAS, blah, blah, blah. So FreeNAS is okay. If you have some basic VM, I wouldn't recommend your whole stack running inside of FreeNAS. I mean, you can do it, but it's just not its not as stable as it is for that. But I'm not worried about it when it comes to things like running my Unify Video. One, the only thing I got to do to move my Unify Video server over here is go through, back up the one config file, move this over to be that spot again, and away we go. So it's not a, a big deal. Uh, the bank was running some type of thin client. So I, I never really dug into what software they were using. We didn't really talk much about that. They had some uh, enterprise banking system they work. He worked there a couple of years back. Um, so they probably, I don't even know if they use the same thing now. 
Yeah, virtualization free NAS is it's better than not having it, but it's certainly not the same as running a whole Zen Orchestra stack. So it's it's super basic by comparison. Yeah, currently my Unify video runs on XCPNG, um, and it's mounted to FreeNAS for storage. So this would save me the trouble of doing that. Instead of mounting it to FreeNAS, uh, it would just run on FreeNAS and, and have local access to storage. So the use case for it is now it doesn't have to do network traversal to do that. So that, yeah. Um, yeah, Open Media Vault uses VirtualBox. Interesting. I never use Open Media Vault. People have asked me about it. Ah, it, I also, and let me find out, I still haven't seen this, Open Media Vault. Well, someone says it changed names. I don't know. Let's look. What they don't list here, and I didn't see this, about features. ZFS, not listed. People keep saying, it's built on ZFS. I said, no, it's not. If it is, they completely have not shared that information with us. The last time I looked at it, it wasn't built with ZFS, and it still doesn't show ZFS. It does not, it, it's just using right here, GPT partitions and software RAID, which is just, the, I'm assuming it's Linux based, so it's using Linux RAID. So ZFS is an add-on. Well, I'm not ready for an add-on. I like the fact that the billion dollar file system that is ZFS is natively built into FreeNAS, which is why I run it. Uh, that's why people ask me to review this. I'm like, it doesn't have any compelling features that make me go, hey, it's better than FreeNAS. What makes it better than FreeNAS? Um, I'm kind of of the ain't broke, don't fix it, yeah, which is the FreeNAS. It's open source, it works great. Uh, it works great, <laughs> it has ZFS. <laughs> Um, have I used Zyxel? I'm not a big fan of the Zyxel. We just did some troubleshooting for someone um, that had some problems with the Zyxel. We solved it for them. Uh, getting their, it's funny, all their PFSense VPNs work, but their Zyxel one didn't. There's like a few extra steps with the Zyxel to get things to work properly. But yeah, they're, they're okay. I don't think they're terrible. Um, I've used them. They seem to be fine. They're pretty basic. They get the job done. Um, okay, Sam's using more than I have. They, I, they used to be popular years ago, um, but I'm not. There's nothing about them that I thought was compelling to me. There was some things were buried too many menus deep, and I was like, well, this seems like more steps than I should have to take. But whatever, it worked, it functioned. Uh, we have an unmanaged client that still has theirs. Undoubtedly, it's way the hell out of date, and they whatever they're not our problem because they don't they're really cheap and they don't like updating things <laughs> this is almost unloading buick grand national i've never owned one but i have drove grand nationals i think i um i don't think any of my friends own them anymore but there i see a lot of them here there's a lot of car clubs around here Uh, any good deal recommendation for cheap switch for honestly, I like the Unify ones are not bad, but neither are the, um, what is it? The edge eight port. And eh, not this one. One like this, there's a couple of them you can find that are pretty reasonable. I'll go on Amazon. Edge switch light. I think it's a, is it the 10X? Yeah. There's a managed switch for 120 bucks. Not terrible. It's like for, oh, sir, it's not like you're saving half. I mean, I, I, the trend net managed switch, I reviewed that one. That one works. Uh, trend net. Managed switch. They make some cheap ones. It's not bad. I mean, it's eight gigabit ports managed for, is this the managed one? Yeah, managed smart gigabit switch, 42 bucks. Not horrible, but super basic. Supports VLANs. That's the only advantage it has. But yeah, I don't know. For the price, it's like a little more you get something that's actually easier to manage. <laughs> Matter of fact, uh, Unify Manage Switch. 
The POE version is $116 for an eight port managed. And that, you know what I mean? That's not bad at all. So $84, yeah, that's an old grand. Those grand nationals are pretty cool. I, I definitely, uh, I definitely liked them back in the day. They were they were a cool car. I was a Camaro guy at the time. I had I had my Camaros. I had my trucks and Camaros. That was uh from back in the day what I did. Um oh Unify controller? I we loaded it. It works. I haven't had any problem with it. Um so I don't know. I didn't have any problems with the other on either. So I seen people say they had stability problems. So I won't negate the fact that some people had problems. I'm just saying I didn't have any. Um, but I also see people do lots of weird things. Uh, under spec machines, not enough memory, et cetera, et cetera. We have eight gigs of RAM and eight cores assigned to our Unify controller. So it hasn't been an issue. <clears throat> it can handle AVB. Um I don't think they've made anything dedicated for it. Not that I know of. So that not, if they have or if it is supported, I don't know. Uh, nope. United States. There we go. Retrieving files and loading updates. Oh yeah, we have, uh, we manage like 60 sites that are, see, we have a lot of managed clients. Well, not a lot. I don't know. Is 60 a lot? I, it depends who you ask. Um, but we manage roughly 60 sites and a lot of devices uh, per site, um, some more, some less. Therefore, we make sure our controller has a lot dedicated to it. Um, and we, we include management of as part of our management managed service plan. It's just kind of rolled into it. Because reality is if I gave them a, a line item, if I gave the customers a line item going, hey, it's X dollars per month to push firmware updates to your Wi-Fi, they would go, I can save that much a month. Because they don't, you know, all they heard was it's this much per month for blah, blah, blah. They go, it, that's why I don't line item it. People always ask that. I'm like, no, no, I don't line item it. It's rolled into their managed services. If we're managing their servers, we're managing their uh, stuff. We just roll in. Reality is managing it is so easy. It's not a complicated uh, process, pushing updates to Wi-Fi and keeping firmware up to date. You go in there, you press the update button. Moving on. It's not It's not some big challenge, so we don't mind doing it. Matter of fact, having visibility into their site is huge for us. So... What's this thing doing now? Services. Let's reload this page. Oh, did the server take a crap? Did I do something? Did it reboot? It seems to have frozen. Ah, uh, unreachable. That didn't go well at all. You're watching live stream of a failed server. It's it's crashed. <laughs> Ten packets transmitted. None received. Okay. I can ping the internet. I can't ping that. It broke. Yep. Oh no. <laughs> Host unreachable. Oh well, that project's over. Something, something, it broke. I don't know why. That server has given me trouble before. It's an old use server. Um, I don't know. So it's like the Cybertruck when the windows broke. Only this runs FreeBSD. <laughs> yeah, added it out after. Yep, it's down. Huh. Well, don't know why it's down. I just know that it's down. Let me log into Unify. Why is it down? Why have you why have you died, server? Got to log into it over here. So I don't expose customer stuff. I don't know what site it's on. And I'll switch to our site. There we go. Go to devices. And we'll go to the 
10 gigs. We have, uh, which one is it? Yeah, this one that's out. <laughs> that's the one that's not working. <laughs> it's labeled. It's just not working right now. So, yep, it's broke. I don't know. It happens. Here's the storage connection. It's got two connections. Uh, and, yeah. So, lights out, man. It broke. <laughs> yeah, this is an old, old super micro server. Um, it has had some random issues. That's why it doesn't... Well, I can't say it doesn't do anything critical. It's where I back up all my videos. But, well, it's actually where I edit all my videos from. And then they're backed up to the other server. So, I'm not in a panic if it doesn't boot again. It would suck. But it's synchronized with the other server. It doesn't run anything else. It's it's completely used for lab and experiments more than anything else. Uh, so it's not that I'm too brokenhearted. For some reason, it completely died. Uh, I do know this. It has a weird bug. It takes a long time to boot. And I haven't figured that out yet either. It just goes, hey, we're going to boot eventually. And so that's definitely – it could be in – it could just be rebooting right now. It does take like 12 to 15 minutes to reboot, and I don't know why. I've never looked into why. It started doing that one day, and I said, that's interesting. <laughs> I thought it died, and uh, then it finally booted after 15 minutes. Now we just realize when it does reboot, it, it's just a long time. <laughs> but uh, it has also just randomly chose to reboot. It's done it. Um, we bought it a year ago and it's done it four times. So it's a really hard problem to track, but obviously running a VM on it, uh, seemed to trigger the event of doing that. So, uh, maybe I'll have to take it apart sometime and dig in to figure out what's actually wrong with it. But I'm actually going to wander off this live stream. I would love to keep it going all day, but I actually have to pee and, uh, go do other stuff like go do Thanksgiving. So... Uh, maybe this server will reboot, uh, but probably not before the live stream's over. Is there anything else for the good of the class and 100 people that are watching? Uh, anything else that I can answer a question on uh, and do that? Because I, I got a few more minutes, but I, as I get to the end of my tea, I got to go in the other, <laughs> go the other way. <laughs> so, oh, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Uh, and thank you for all of you that wished a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah, have I tried Open Media Vault? Yeah, minutes ago I talked about how I've never tried it and don't have an issue in trying it. So, <laughs> yeah, the uh, so uh, awesome. Thank you, Grayson. Enjoy your day as well. Smoked ribs sound amazing. Um, I was actually no one wanted me to make any smoke stuff, so yeah, I didn't. So I I wouldn't mind. It'd be nice if some it, to have some. Yeah. Uh. Have I ever dealt with store virtual? What are they? No. Nope. Actually, none of those. Store virtual USA, some HPE product. Yeah. Licenses and fees and raid support. Nope. 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 We just use free NAS. Matter of fact, that's actually, it's kind of a funny thing. Um, how many people are uh, kind of anti-open source and things like that? But and I'm I've been a long time open source advocate, and it's it's gone really well for us because uh, so many more people are exploring open source. Because as these closed source solutions are just not, they're realizing they're not always as robust as some of these other ones. So, how do you store FreeNAS VM to without having uh, without it being through networking? How do you store data from a FreeNAS VM to FreeNAS? It's all done. That's the whole thing. It doesn't have import export of VMs. It doesn't have any of that. It builds it on a ZVAL as a hard drive. And that's kind of it. Then it attaches a network that shares the networking layer with the FreeNAS box. So that. Uh, can you use PoE switches with a non-PoE device? Sure can. Hey, thank you for, and anyone who uh, hasn't smashed the like button yet, yes, uh, go ahead and smash that like button. I'm an open source advocate. Well, even, I even donated $34 to Free, uh, Free NAS or uh, Open Source Foundation. Yes, that's awesome. I highly encourage people to do that. Hey, if you get something for free, awesome. Um, that you can't beat it for free. 
I donate money to the tour project, the uh, Caden Live uh, project. I, matter of fact, I got some, it's out of view of the camera. Up above me are some letters and things I've got for gifting money to the um, KDE Foundation, I think it is, is who actually gets the money and then they distribute it to uh, Caden Live. That's a video editor I use. So yeah, I'm I'm big on giving money away. And actually I got um, this year because we're nearing the end of the year, we're going to be giving more money away to some of these foundations um, because why not? Uh, it's a good idea. Also the Electronic Frontier Foundation. There's a lot of them out there uh, to help these things out. So, you know, maybe I should do some Q&A on PoE. Uh, PoE and hot swap and fun stuff like that. Because PoE, but I guess I should probably qualify this. On a PoE switch, let's talk about that real quick here. So let's go to the studio switch. That's PoE. Currently, there is, I don't know what's plugged in. Something's plugged in here. The port 3 that's using some wattage. Something plugged in here is not using wattage. So right here, port 17, no watts. Port 3, wattage. But one of the things you can do is go here and you can go passive versus off passive PoE. You can plug in when it's in normal PoE mode, anything you want in there that's network based, it'll work. It just won't use the PoE part. If you turn passive on, it electrifies a couple pins. If you turn passive on, that means force power uh, into those pins, whether the device asked for power or not. PoE devices that are proper uh, modern ones ask the switch to send them power. Some older model devices have to use passive mode to force power down the line because they don't ask, but they expect it. So if you turn on passive mode and you hook a device up that wasn't expecting it, it could damage the device. So generally speaking, you can plug them in. Specifically speaking, if you turn on passive mode, don't. Or if you have a path, they do make passive devices that have that mode on all the time. So just be careful. Can I do more videos on entrepreneurship, more, more of your history and ways? Uh, yeah, I should probably do another video on that. Uh, it's funny because those videos don't always get the most views, which makes me think people don't want to see them. So yeah, I don't know. Um, I want to do more. I have a handful of them. If you just go through my business talk videos, but yeah, maybe we should do a video. We kind of, that same group of friends, because I talked to them, uh, we've talked about getting together a couple more times to try to do an, a part two of that. Uh, matter of fact, um, uh, white... Uh, apparently, I'm bad at spelling. I spelled it wrong, but here we go. So Dana, who is on there, um, this is in a apparently Boyd. I'm bad. Sorry, I'm bad at spelling your stuff. She was one of the entrepreneurs that was on there, and she was just featured in. Pull up news right here. So these are some of my entrepreneur friends. So once again, uh, there's her and the other person on there was Eric Thomas. I'm having lunch again with there, but yeah, she was on uh, Yahoo Finance there. So there's the same Dana White who was on there. Uh, this is why it's hard. These people like myself are all very busy. I happen to be centric around videos. They are not. So them organizing the time to all come to my office was awesome, but they can't do it all the time. So it makes it kind of challenging uh, to do. So, <laughs> and you know, this is just, I want to do more videos on entrepreneurship, but they can be kind of tricky to do. And they are kind of off beat from my channel. You know what I mean? Like they're not, they're not part of the norm. I would like to make a more norm, but you know, that's a thing. So it takes time to do all this on my to-do list. So <laughs> yeah, it's a different target uh, market and it's hard to figure out where to put that uh, type of data. So it's uh, that's the challenge with any one-off things. Like, do I make more Tesla videos? They seem to have done pretty good on my channel, but uh, as I think they're more techie people do like Teslas, but the entrepreneurship ones are more one-off. But then again, maybe I should just do more of them uh, on money management and things like that. I think they're important things you need to know uh, about how to you know manage the finances, manage that. There's a lot of balancing act that comes with running a business and managing everything around it. So.
Oh, all right. I think that's it for me. I'm going to take off. Thank you once again for everyone who joined in. I gave you guys two hours on this wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you for joining. Thank you for tuning in. Hey, it came back. It It's back. We'll log into it before I leave. I bet it's... Uh... Yep, it just decided to crash and lock. I don't know. So, <laughs> uh, oh, I I should not do one about balance and personal work. I'm I'm a you ask the person who's doing a live stream uh, for two hours on Thanksgiving about work life balance. You are not asking the right person. By the way, think about that for a minute. I'm probably, of course, I'm probably like a lot of other entrepreneurs as well. But you probably note that, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is this is not a good question for me because I am probably not the shining example uh, that that would be work life balance. I am highly obsessive, over the top um, about the way I do many many things. So I'm not, yeah I'm gonna throw it out there. Work life balance don't don't take cues from Tom on this topic. <laughs> so. Yeah, of course, we're talking to the people who are watching a two-hour stream. So, yeah, I am all in on work. How's that? All in on work. Um, but I do take time off. I take my kids places and stuff like that. So that, that's at least, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I might be an example of things. You know, and like I said, uh, I know I can just keep babbling on forever probably. It's not that I have a complete imbalance because I do all kinds of one-off things. Um, my favorite being, where did it go? <laughs> Which this one makes me laugh. My wife's not gonna be happy about it. She just like made the perfect face. Because <laughs> we, we go for walks out in the woods. This is over at uh, the Henry Ford. No, wait, this is, that's Heritage. Um, car pictures, food pictures of friends. Me hanging out in Florida. What else is there? Choo, 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 choo. Car show, uh, one second. Yes, that's what I was looking for. Nope, that wasn't it either. Where did it go? What am I looking for? There it is. Uh, anyways, I can't find it. It's a couple of the motorcycle pictures. Go out in the woods on motorcycles, one of my hobbies as well. So definitely, I, I do take time off to go do stuff. So it's not that I don't do anything, but I have to be doing something all the time. And I've been playing Borderlands 3, so... Uh, yeah, I can't tell when I'm working and when I'm not. I don't... Buy, my, I didn't get a performance model Tesla, so that's why I don't race it. And last Sunday, I spent wandering around uh, uh, the Henry Ford uh, estate mansion. And uh, so, you know, I do things like this. I have to be doing something all the time. I'm very hyper. And uh, so there's that. All right. I'm actually going to leave now. I'm going to close all this. I don't need all this open. I got to unlock this server, but <laughs> do I wish I got a P3D? No, I'm not worried about it. I didn't buy the Tesla for performance uh, because my plan was to buy the Roadster, but now I'm probably going to buy the truck and I'm buying the performance model of the truck. So, and I want to build an electric hot rod. So that's, a, that's another project I have an idea for. So hopefully that, hopefully that makes sense. I don't know. My, my other priority before then is going to be buying another house. I, we want, I have too big of a house in my opinion. We're actually going to either custom build or downsize to a smaller house. Um, and I don't have a huge house, but my kids are growing up and moving away. So that's a whole fun stuff. Wow. Breaking your wrists on a bike. That sounds unpleasant. I, um, I'm older and I don't I don't like injuries as much because the, the older you get, the harder they are to heal. <laughs> All right, and thanks. I'll leave you guys with that thought. <laughs>